always noise and guns, and we like doing that. I still enjoy it. Yeah, I know it's a really honored position within the police force to be a, to be a SWAT cop's a huge thing. It's really a very realistic viewpoint of what it is to be a SWAT officer in a city like Los Angeles today. <laughs> Top Gun meets High Noon. to come and do this. These guys were all cool actors. They get it, and they get what they're doing. They're all complex actors. They're all smart actors. When you go to cast the roles, you really want people to bring to life those characters. And the first person that we signed on to this movie was Sam Jackson. I couldn't think of anybody better to play Sergeant Dan Hondo Harrelson. This character works to live. When you see his house and his living situation, there are no other people there. There's no wife, there's no kids. He's pretty much dedicated himself to the to the job. He's proud of his accomplishments as a cop, and he's proud of his team's accomplishments because of the way he's trained them. Hondo is the cop's cop. Sam's character left under a cloud, and uh, because he was a good cop, and because the city needed him, he was asked back to his former glory. His nemesis in, 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 in this plot line is the guy that he used to partner with him, who's now his lieutenant. So he comes back to work for that guy, and he's asked to get a team together. That's what propels the story. So Sam is the catalyst for all that. There's a correlation between me and Hondo and the way that I try and lead by example. It's incumbent upon me to set an example for these young actors by you know, showing up prepared, uh, to show up with a great attitude, um, to enjoy the things I'm doing, to help them from time to time in terms of getting a shot and making it right, to show them that I really appreciate this job and I appreciate the opportunities that I get when I do this job. Primarily the reason why I wanted to do this picture was to work with Sam Jackson because I was just a huge admirer of his work and just a huge admirer of him as an actor and, and I really just wanted to be on the same set as him. One of the main reasons why I wanted to do this movie is to work with Sam. He was a big influence on me doing SWAT. For me, working with Sam Jackson is just really special. He's become somewhat of a mentor to me in terms of just someone that I can be around, that I can kind of look to and, you know, ask a couple of questions. He's a veteran. He's a true professional. Um, shows up on set ready to work and uh, he's also very helpful. I mean, there's been many times where I've been stuck and he's offered his advice and input, which is, has gotten me through. And he's, he's just very smart and very talented man. Very helpful. Brian's going to be, you know, a major person in this industry, uh, and I'm glad that I'm able to be a part of his development, you know, as that. And hopefully, um, all the rest of these guys will feel the same way when they finish, you know, working with me. That they learn something from me, like I learned something from them, you know, just by watching. Them. And it's great to be around young guys; it makes you feel young. He plays a kick-ass, cool Hondo, huh? <laughs> And we needed somebody to play the Officer Jim Street role. Colin Farrell just felt like a great choice. He felt like a guy who could be the maverick, but could also be part of a team. He's demoted, and the only reason that he, he can rise up above that again is because Hondo, Sam Jackson's character, comes back on the scene. Am I looking at another day of show for duty? Well, I do have one more spot. Think of anybody I might have overlooked? Is this a game or a test, Sergeant? Could be a bit of both. I'm a little old for games. So how'd you like to be back on SWAT? I want you on my team. He's always been involved in the armed forces, probably always wanted to be since he was a little kid, and for the right reasons, you know? Not for the power of having a gun, but just to, just to do a little bit of good if you can, you know? And to be busy doing it, and to be, you know, liking, liking the action, and liking the danger aspect of it as well. But, but he's a pretty simple man who's happy with his apartment on the beach, and, you know, going for a jog with his dog every now and then, and, and doing a bit of surfing, and hanging out with a few beers. Colin and I really worked a lot on backstory. When we met for the very first time before the film started, we got, got along right away and ended up being, you know, soulmates in some sort of weird way. Like, you know, 
different family. We really didn't have to work on too much camaraderie when it came to the locker rooms. We really wanted to try to put in any, some sort of history. Yeah, so I think we really wanted to make it real. Really try to keep it real. Gamble assumes that he ratted on. That's part of Gamble's troubles is that he feels his, he was betrayed by his friend Street. Street is a damn good cop and a damn good SWAT officer and he should be back on a force. He has to prove that uh, they were wrong, he was right, and, and he belongs here. Colin has really become one of my favorite actors because he brings such truth to the work. LL has got great street cred anyway as a human being, and he brings that to his character too. How you like that? Suspect headed south, what's the defiance? One black male in Lakers purple. What are you doing, Navy SEAL? behind your back. Name's Hondo. Well, if you like hard work, long hours, and getting dirty for low pay, I got an opening on my SWAT yeah, team. How you like that? I don't mind that at all. Dick is a uh, good cop, honest cop, strong son of a bitch. Just good SWAT material, good free thinker. Dick is pretty simple. He's a SWAT cop who's, who's, who's very aggressive and, and believes in what he's doing, wants to protect the innocent, save people from harm's way, and he does everything he can to do that. It's rare that these cops, SWAT guys, come into a situation that's not already volatile. So in order for them to deal effectively, they have to have good people skills too. Deke obviously has a, a, a rapport in the community. Deke is a cool character. He gets to do a lot of cool things, jump over planes, shoot out of limousines. All of, the, all of my childhood and boyhood fantasies came to fruition in this movie. See, this is what we do for a living. Hondo's going through the files and he sees Chris Sanchez. He says, well, this kick-ass cop. I'll go meet this guy and see if he's up to the job. Hey, what do you need, Sarge? Sanchez do that? Mm-hmm. I'm starting to like this Sanchez already. Spent four years in Metro, passed the SWAT calls three times, been rejected by Fuller three times. Bless your who? Sorry, wrong room. What are you looking for? Chris Sanchez. I'm Chris Sanchez. You're Chris Sanchez? So Hondo goes to check out this uh, Sanchez guy and turns out to be this Sanchez woman who's just uh, beat the stuffing out of a bad guy who was up to no good. Sanchez's character is a female who came from Texas and her lifestyle is pretty hectic when she arrives here in Los Angeles because she's uh, pushed towards the ghetto while her parents are like finding a job or whatnot. And I think she just grew up seeing such you know, horrible things, you know, because the crime out here is so bad, and, and it's really like no remorse, no mercy in the streets. So I think that kind of like inspired her to try to rise above that. I think that she just wanted to become a cop and make things a little better for her, her children, you know? It's always interesting to do a movie when there's one female character and there's like eight guys. It must be very difficult, but Michelle is a fabulous, wonderful, person who gets along extremely well with all of us. Brian Van Holt and Josh Charles are two really smart, really thinking actors, and uh, what they bring is, they bring the stuff that they're supposed to bring, which is, okay, I get this guy right now. Foster is a, more of a seasoned cop compared to the other characters in the movie. He and TJ, they're returning SWAT officers. I play TJ McCabe's veteran SWAT officer. He's a sniper, really good shot, really cocky, a bit greedy. TJ, um, sort of gets involved with this plan with Gamble and uh, decides to try to take uh, Alex and, and get the money and uh, sells his soul to the devil in the process. But uh, I think he sort of gets in and over his head. He wasn't expecting it to, uh, to go down the way it did. I think we are a great cast with very different energy. And it fits very well. Of my character. He's very dangerous, he's very famous, very well known all over the world. So I kill a couple of people. And they arrest me by accident, and in fact, I make an offer. It's quite interesting for the bad guys. I just said, the guy who take me out of jail will make $100 million. The one bad guy, I had the fortuitous luck to make him French. <laughs> And now we can look at the French again without talking about freedom fries and 
Freedom Kisses. And uh, I've got a bad guy who's French. We can have some fun with it. Olivier Martinez plays the bad guy, and he's a great actor. And he's a very charismatic actor. And uh, aside from being the heart and thumb, he brings an element to it also that's uh, more complex than the usual mustache twisting villain. He's got issues. Why did he change Los Angeles? We give 100 million dollars to whoever gets me out of there. 100 million dollars? What? We put on a week SWAT school for the actors with live fire. Uh, we taught them how to move tactically together as a team. It's not often that we get to, you know, shoot live ammo or see if we really could hit a target if we were aiming at it. I get paid to do a job that I, I would gladly do for free. The least you can do, I think, you know, is, is prepare as hard as, as you can, you know, think about it as much as you can, and just do the work, and it's fun, you know. Each one of these guys really wanted to take on that role of being a modern-day SWAT officer. So the training was not only thrilling for these guys, but educational, and it was a way where we were able to let these guys bond together and actually become a real SWAT team. It was a few weeks, and it was pretty intense. Randy, the uh, on-set SWAT guy, did a great job of just making sure that the movie has the realism of SWAT. Where's we the had, penetration uh, point? Up here at this wall. We're going to get right to that here in one second. Let's uh, put Michelle up here first. Now, Josh, when they go by this window here, as she passes, you, you'll pick the coverage up on the window, and then Sam will uh, come around the corner as well. It helps you understand these guys' jobs a lot better, and the amount of time and training it takes to be able to do things without thinking or to use your instincts. So what has to happen is this cable has to be hooked up here. Exactly. Is it going to already be hooked up to that? No. So then sure. so he'll have the ability to hook it up. Just come up along with a truck, exactly. tactically. Go ahead and run it up here like this with the cable. Yeah. Snap it on. Do it that way. You didn't have anybody covering that window over there? You, you learn the lingo, you know, the clear, the, the section neutralized and all that. And um, you get the hand signals. You won't even flinch because you're, you'll have done this so many times, that that's gonna be a, a usual noise to you. So you're gonna be standing right here. When that wall goes, just maintain your position here until it's time to go. So they talk about different entry tactics and all that kind of stuff and, and, and weaponry that is used. So find the shelf, be right here. behind me, moving like this, all right? So we're coming around the tree. Sam is gonna go out here and grab the cable. I was gonna run the cable, cable up. Us here. Meet right? us here. And yeah. after you guys do this, you're just gonna get in this position right here and they'll hit it. We're actually doing what these guys do, and in certain moments like that, it's a little hairy. They taught us how to clear a room, how to approach a suspect in a, in a hostage situation. Okay, you're pushing the door. Oh, you're going to We'll put you in. They taught us just the procedures and how you would approach a situation, whatever that situation may be. Bring them on in, boys. Okay, that way. Two, three, four, three. Right up here. Right up here. Let's let the shotgun go with him. Shotgun MP5. That'll be a better way to go. No, okay, you're so gonna, yeah. gonna hold that. So Michelle, you and Colin are gonna come together. Exactly there. We're gonna go into this room and clear it. Where is Colin's position when I when Colin, I see this? So I'm them. coming in with turds. You're coming in Where are right? these guys at that right time? They're coming in this room. Okay. We had a great tech advisor, Randy Walker. He had he brought a team of guys that uh, work with us. What we're watching for is really, do they look like a real SWAT officer? Are they carrying the gun right? Are they looking in the right direction? Is the finger off the trigger? A lot of the little things that we've discussed with the actors um, since pre-production about how we do things. So we realize that they have marks and dialogue and other things other than SWAT to think about. So we're kind of there to help remind them if we see something that they need to do um, to help further that portrayal. Like that, you're, you're probably walk up and do one of these, and then back here. I think that's how we cut. That's how we cut you. That's how we cut this way? No, that's how we cut this shot. So we pick you up over there. I just uh, spoke to these guys, the SWAT team members from Los Angeles, who are really, like, on it. These guys are so focused and so by the book, it's not even funny. Gomez is a really cool guy. He's seen it all, man. <laughs> all these SWAT team members, uh, I mean, Colin Farrell and, and Samuel Jackson, LL Cool J and the other three, they were all very receptive to what we had to tell them. They would seek us out. Am I holding this gun right? Am I walking right? Am I shooting right? You know, am I carrying myself equipment properly? They would come to us and also when we sit back and watch them rehearsing and we would say, hang on a second, try this or do this. We work with all of them, just whatever you happen to see, you would go, we would go tell that person or they would come to us, whoever they happen to see, but they were quick to catch on and, and they 
they look good. They look good from what, from what I saw. I always want to make sure that we're giving an honest portrayal of the people who actually do the job that we're supposedly on film doing. Uh, so I'm constantly asking Randy, who's um, our major consultant, if we look legitimate, if what I'm saying is something that would actually be said so that when police officers are watching the film, they can look at it and say, that's right. But was Sanchez wasn't over here? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, yes. good. And she'll be the first to see the guy. No, Sanchez is looking for the door. Or she she didn't leave the door? Well, what can happen is, as soon as this wall goes, we can put her into the fray. That's not a problem. What I learned from, from these guys is why. How they go about doing what they do, what, what training is involved, and, and that gives it a sense of realism. Clark was um, so old been so concerned about making sure that everything was done authentic and was always asking us questions and making sure that, that if things weren't done this way that how should they be done and and he would change things to make sure they were right. I come from a family full of cops so after talking to Clark I saw a lot of respect for this one. Trying to learn how to drive like an IPD officer. Are we going go car racing after this? Uh, I've worked SWAT for uh, about 16 years, from 81 to 97. The primary attribute that people are looking for is a hardworking police officer. They want to make sure that whoever they're picking is a dedicated, professional officer that's going to give 110% all the time. My name's Lee McMillian, and I've been with SWAT for seven years. For starters, it would have to be someone that's self-motivated, someone that, that knows what they want, that is willing to do all of the extra work that they're not going to be compensated for in recognition or monetarily. My name is Mike Baker, and I've been on the SWAT team for almost 10 years. They're looking for people that are good with a handgun, good with weapons, physically fit. Our training cycle is ongoing and progressive. It's a series of tests along the way because there's not one incident that's going to incorporate all of the disciplines that we train in to work SWAT. We also have a lot of training that we do as far as movement, covert movement, which is entering a building and trying to locate a suspect who's hiding and trying to do that as quietly as possible. There's a lot of training involved, but in my own personal opinion, you can train forever, but nothing compares with an actual situation. I don't remember what my first call up was, but I do remember that I was glad to get it. Mount up, we got the call. You know what they say, you're either SWAT ah! or you're not. Let's try to get in the killing mode. I am in killing mode. So why are you smiling? Because it tickles me. It's kind of funny. I, I watched the trailer to the movie, and I, and I remember Michelle Rodriguez said, what's the real thing like? And I think Colin Farrell's response is a lot faster. And that's kind of a pretty accurate perception of, of what, what's going on out there. What's it like, the real thing? It's faster. 60 guys that train together, that work together constantly, that are engaged in life-threatening situations on a daily basis in the city of Los Angeles. So there is a very tight bond there within the SWAT team. It's a great group of people. And when the pager goes off or the phone call comes in, everything gets dropped and it's all one group of people trying to solve a problem. I think I work with 60 of the finest men on the planet. And we spend so much time together in everything we do. It is very much like family. This is a tactical SWAT vest, uh, level 3A, which is the top of the line. The pouches where officers would carry their different equipment are interchangeable. It's Velcro and snap, so a person can change it around so they can move comfortably and uh, get to the things that they need. These are magazine pouches for ammo. Um, just a variety of utility pouches that fit different magazines for the weapons. Our radio would go on the back. So that, that's pretty much it. It just, it just depends on the individual officer and how they would want it to set up. I can't believe that they do the things they do wearing their vests. It's hard for me to walk, more or less like run and jump and shoot and crawl through spaces and maneuver. It's incredible. The 
the front third of our truck is all crisis negotiation equipment. Our negotiators are going to try and resolve it peacefully using a hardline phone, or what we call a throw phone, which has like, I don't know, a thousand feet of cord, and you can literally throw that phone through the suspect's window and give them a way to talk to our negotiators. Okay, this is Chris from the LAPD. The SWAT truck holds all of the specialized equipment that is just too big or too cumbersome for us to keep on ourselves, whether it's additional munitions or climbing gear, you know, caving ladders or poles. Computers, so that we can find out who we're talking to, criminal history, tear gas, flashlights, communications. It just goes on and on. This is not the kind of group that you want to challenge or, you know, I would suggest you surrender and, you know, live a rich and fulfilling life. <laughs> it's just a really gritty, exciting popcorn type movie, but with the reality of what it is to be a SWAT officer in LA. It's an action film. Grind. For a bunch of bad guys sitting around, $100 million is, you know, worth the risk. You will be ready for anyone and anything. The opening sequence in the film was based on the North Hollywood shooting. It was a horrific moment in LA history. Clark wanted to make it as real as possible. There were really no rules. It was just to try to create terrifying aspects of a, a very serious bank robbery. It was really important to set the tone for the movie to say, okay, this is a reality-based movie. This is based on a real event. I was there the moment we started filming, and uh, the movie really started off with a bang. In terms of the planning of the shootout, we tried to keep true to what had actually happened to these guys. Black and whites pulled up on the scene, and they were immediately outgunned. And they called for backup, and as the poster says, even the cops call 911. It's not a PG-13 world they work in. Clark wanted to kind of make it really gritty, kind of down and dirty, as you like to call it. We overcranked camera speeds a lot of the time with the helicopters, which slows their rotors down. You know, he wanted to make it look like it was being shot by a news crew, basically. Um, like, it was almost like news footage. So when you're outside, you get that, you know, herky-jerky camera, you know, extreme zoom-in, zoom-outs. So then inside, when you're with the robbers and, and uh, our two SWAT guys coming in, it's more of the classical filmmaking where, you know, it's not that, and he wanted those two different extremes. Everything was mixed and matched. I had ground, surface-to-surface -surface cameras, air-to-air, air-to-ground, so there's a great variety. It was all a choreographed kind of orchestrated mayhem. Basically, our plan of attack was on Saturday and Sunday to do all the exterior work, to have full closure of the streets, all the low-flying helicopters. We couldn't do that during the week. From there, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the plan was to start with the uh, Colin and Jeremy coming in from the roof and trying to do that as, as much as in sequence as possible. And by doing that, we were able to film the sequence in order, start to finish, just to keep the continuity of it. We had like 50 setups our first day. Yeah. Put the fear of God in that crew. It was clear we were going to have to find a, an abandoned bank or an abandoned building that looked like a bank because any real bank will not let you film there, number one, let alone, you know, do gunfire and helicopters flying low. And uh, we ended up in Lincoln Heights, which is like on North Broadway just over the LA River kind of below Pasadena. It was a perfect location for us, really. They were really happy to have us filming in their neighborhood. There's not a lot of filming goes on over there. I would say two weeks before shooting, basically all our focus went to the bank. Originally, it wasn't gonna be the first thing we were, we were gonna shoot, because they were gonna blow it up eventually. We had to shoot it first. And actually, we, I'm very glad we, we, we did, because you could really prep it. All right, let's do another rehearsal, please. And we could shoot it up, put squib hits wherever we wanted, basically do whatever we wanted to it. And I tell you, that's that's a rare thing to have. The planning of that, because it was the first thing we did, was more elaborate. We actually got to go there and rehearse and walk it through. We knew exactly where every car was going to be, where every person was going to be, and where every helicopter was going to be. Well, we're going to rehearse with everything. Right, we were very lucky to find it and very happy with the way it turned out. 
The opening sequence is the first time we established the SWAT vehicle. The SWAT van in the TV show was like an old bread truck. Even as a little kid, I remember looking at this, look at that truck, who is driving that thing around? But this SWAT truck is the mother of all SWAT trucks. It was good and bad, the SWAT vehicle. Uh, it looked great, and it was a really cool design, and it's great, but uh, um, it had a lot of mechanical problems. Because it's not the SWAT vehicle that they use. We specifically designed it for our movie to make it look cool. Took a brand new fire truck and rebuilt it. And so it's this big high-tech truck with the stuff that they would like to have. I guess the big logistic problem we had was flying helicopters at a low level. Flying like a military helicopter below 200 feet in a populated area is not normally done. We had to get over 500 signatures from neighbors and businesses in order to do what we did there. My perspective of Los Angeles, being from New York, is some camera angle from way above looking down at some, some catastrophic event or some car chase. And so I mastered from above a lot. So a lot of the big wide shots were from helicopter. So it's pretty elaborate up there. There's a pretty big dance in the air. Another part of my job as an AD is um, safety, guns, and all that. And uh, Mike Papik, our, our weapons guy, was fantastic. Prior to filming, we spent a week with the entire cast where everybody got to shoot each individual weapon. They shot the M4, their handguns, the shotguns, the MP5s. They all shot them all. It was important to me that if we're going to portray these guys, I want them to be as real as I can. You know, being an actor myself, it's always important to me that the behavior is bang on. Now, I want you to come to low ready for me. Pop up in the position, bam, there you go. We will work with each individual actor for their stance, their shooting positions, um, you know, how they should be holding the gun and all that kind of stuff. So they look like they know what they're doing with the weapons. Our actors really worked hard to get that training up, so they looked the part. The wardrobe in the film, uh, as far as the SWAT clothing is concerned, is, is uh, identical to the clothing worn by the real SWAT officers. In fact, uh, I think the actors gained an appreciation for how it felt to have to wear all the clothing. That stuff that they wear keeps them alive. It's also hot and heavy. It's like 70 pounds. They really got into it, and I think they really gained an appreciation for not only the role they were going to be playing, but for the real SWAT officers as well. These guys all did a great job, from the weapons and the wardrobe, and uh, all of it was very well done. I think initially my goal editorially was to kind of reach out and grab the audience by the throat and say, don't go out for popcorn. Sit down and stay in your seat, because what you're about to see is going to be really compelling. What Michael Tronic had done is gotten the actual police calls during that event, and that set the tone for the intro of the film. That was then transcribed and re-performed by actors. I wanted a visceral reaction. There's no way you can hide the terror of a, of a dispatcher realizing that there are guys with AK-47s shooting at police officers who are terribly outmanned. I think the way Clark shot it and the way Michael put it together, there was a lot of tension in that opening sequence. It was editorially a very challenging sequence because of all the different formats and the tremendous amount of footage, and still tell a story because that's when our heroes are introduced. I kind of like to mix it up when I shoot. Whatever's fitting for the, for the scene. So in the midst of creating this very gritty documentary feel, we still got major motion picture movie stars that are being introduced into the story. The point of this movie was, these guys have to make a life and death decision. And a decision was made in that bank that impacted the rest of the movie. So it was really important that we told the story as, as, as accurately as we could. SWAT, the opening sequence, the whole movie, I'm, I'm extremely proud of it. The pace of this picture probably aged me a couple of years in one year. What I saw was everything Clark had wanted it to be. SWAT was really important in that scenario, so it seemed a perfect opportunity to uh, talk about what those guys are thrust into every day.